Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you happen to be watching this. I hope you're having a good day, and if you miss class, I hope to see you in the next class period. Today, we're getting something of what I guess I'm just going to call, for lack of a better word, a book report. And I hope that by the time I'm finished with this, you can see some of the links to some of the essays we're going to be writing later on in the semester, and certainly can see the link to the definitional essay that's going to be assigned relatively soon. The book report is on a book by Dr. Alan Jacobs, and it is entitled How to Think. One of the connections, I believe, to How to Think is the connection to the mission of the Mount Marty English Department. The mission there is to develop graduates who think creatively and critically, in addition to graduates who communicate well. And so we're talking about composition, literary analysis, creative writing. This is a composition class. We're going to talk about thinking critically how to think. By way of background, Dr. Alan Jacobs is the Distinguished Professor of Humanities in the Honors Program at Baylor University, or at least he was when he wrote this book. Uh, he's the author of many books, How to Think, The Year of Our Lord, 1943, Breaking Bread with the Dead, uh, which is about reading old books. And I think believe deeply that this book will apply to a lot of classes that students take here at Mount Marty, not just composition class. If you look at the subtitle, A Survival Guide for a World at Odds, a world at odds with logic, a world at odds with itself, a world where people are at odds with each other. Jacobs gives this definition that this is what thinking is. And you will notice that he does not run to the dictionary. He breaks it down into parts and he talks about the actions involved in thinking. Thinking is not the decision. Thinking is what goes into the decision. All of the consideration that one makes when one decides and that thinking can involve whether to order uh, two hamburgers or a hamburger and fries. How does one assess that? You'll notice that it's testing your responses. It's weighing the available evidence. It's grasping as best you can with all available and relevant senses. So it's not just something out there. It's dealing with you personally. So for example, a descriptive essay. Well, how do I decide what to describe? Well, the descriptive essay may well appeal to the senses. And it keeps going on, avail, grasping with what is. The definition goes on. And it's also speculating as carefully and responsibly as you can about what might be. So, for example, we're going to do a cause and effect essay later on. What might be, what causes X? If X happens, what might be the results of Y? Also, notice that thinking involves getting help sometimes. But it's not just when to get help, it's whom you should ask for help. All of that becomes a, a big, huge chunk of thinking. We're going to come back to this definition a little bit later. But Jacobs gives us a really broad idea of thinking. It's, it's a huge part of the college experience. And so I think it's an important part to look at as we deal with writing, which I believe involves thinking every time we put something down on paper. Jacobs goes on to argue that people do not want to think. If you look at the bold here on screen, it tires us out. It can force us out of the familiar, comforting habits, and it can complicate our lives. Okay, and sometimes when we start thinking, we come to conclusions that differ from the conclusions of people around us. And it com we come to conclusions that differ from the conclusions of a lot of other people that we like. And that can set us at odds with those people. 
if we don't think, if we just merely go along with the crowd, if we go along with all the people who we normally agree with, and we never step out of our comfort zones, life's a lot easier. So Jacobs here not only defines thinking as a whole series of things, he gives us a set of consequences for what might happen if we think too much. Jacobs goes on to talk about that this is not a new phenomenon. T.S. Eliot, almost a century ago, writes about when there is so much to be known, when there are so many fields of knowledge. And again, remember, he's writing this in 19, the 19 teens, long before 2022, long before the internet, long before anything that we think of being able to immediately access information. When everyone knows a little about a great many things, it becomes increasingly difficult for anyone to know whether he knows what he is talking about or not. Thinking forces us into a situation where A, we may have to admit we don't know what we're talking about. We may have to slow down and think before we speak. Think before we write. We might have to consider. We might have to do all of those things in that first slide where he was giving the definition. And then he goes on to talk about when we do not know or when we do not know enough, we tend to substitute emotions for thoughts. We tend to react emotionally, not logically, if we don't know enough or we are uncertain about what it is that we do know. Now Jacobs goes on to say that thinking does require emotion. We are not going to be Mr. Spock from Star Trek or Data from Star Trek The Next Generation or any of the Vulcans or androids that show up in Star Trek or show up in any television program where they are totally and completely emotionless. Being rational is not necessarily thinking well all the time. Uh, weighing evidence is sometimes an emotional experience as well as a logical experience. But notice it's not the suppression of all feelings. It's the suppression of the right feelings. I think Jacobs would go so far as to make that a big chunk of it. Jacobs then goes on to think, speak of the idea that no one is an original thinker, that no one can think independently of other human beings, that thinking is social. Everything you think is a response to someone else Everything you think is a response to what someone else has thought, someone else has said. You are writing summary response papers. You are responding to Green. You are responding to me in class. All of those thoughts are social thoughts. I am trying to respond to you. That's a social interaction. No one can think independently. And then Green goes on to, I think, make an important distinction here. Independent thinking is often an act of belonging. That when we say somebody is thinking for herself, it means that this person is saying things that conform to what I think, is saying things that conform to what the people I like are saying, and they are not sounding like people I dislike. And I believe a lot of times when we want somebody to think for themselves, we are asking them to sound like us. And I think that Jacobs does a great job of putting that all together here. I may have said green earlier, as I said many times. These are one-take slides, one-take presentations. Jacobs then goes on to talk about metaphor. And... He argues that we have 
decided to make argument a warlike activity. And that if we start talking about thinking and arguing as an attempt to achieve mutual understanding, an attempt to clarify views, people aren't going to listen to us. People are going to say that arguments are things you should go out to win. And I believe thinking at some level is an act of arguing with yourself. And so that we have to reject the idea that war and argument are simultaneous, that those two things are synonymous. We're trying to achieve understanding. We're trying to clarify our views. And even though thinking is social, thinking is responding to other people and responding to other ideas, Thinking, I think, being social means you are arguing with yourself to clarify your views with yourself first, so that then you can clarify your views with others. Jacobs then goes on to talk about, we use all sorts of metaphors, and that metaphors are woven into myths and that we believe in these myths and we cease to recognize them as metaphors. We cease to recognize them as ways of telling stories to ourselves, ways of organizing the world for ourselves. And we start to view myths and metaphors as facts. And at that moment, they become dangerous. And at that moment, once we cease to recognize these myths and metaphors as facts, then we cease to think. Jacobs concludes that in search of social belonging, we take a lot of shortcuts, especially when we're in the presence of like-minded people. And we come to rely on keywords, we come to rely on metaphor, we come to rely on myth, and these habits become more deeply ingrained, and these habits inhibit our ability to think. The goal of this presentation, the goal of my introducing this book, the goal of the book report is to get you to wonder ever so often, am I thinking or am I parroting? Am I buying into things I've heard a million times? Am I using buzzwords? Am I using metaphors? Am I challenging myself to disagree with my social group ever so often? Am I challenging myself to go beyond what I've heard? And am I going challenging myself to ask questions? I think thinking in a lot of ways is asking questions. To tie this to writing for a little bit. First of all, next week, I'm going to talk about the definitional essay. And one of the things I'm going to discuss is that the definition is operational. This definition is operational. It doesn't come from a dictionary. It talks about this is what the operations of thinking are. It's testing, it's grasping, it's speculating carefully and responsibly, and it's knowing when to go it alone, when asked to help. There are a lot of operations involved in this definition. So for at least one paper, this is a sample of what an operational definition should look like. And again, I think anytime one thinks, anytime one argues, and I've said several times in class, everything's an argument. Every time one writes, it's an attempt to achieve mutual understanding. It's a means of clarifying our views. Thinking and argument and writing should be those things. So whether it's a summary response, whether it's a cause and effect, whether it's a definitional essay, even whether it's the uh, narrative essay that we are just finishing. All of those should be about clarifying views. Jacobs then goes on to have a checklist about are you thinking or not? And it's a very, very broad checklist. We'll spend a little bit of time running through this thing and just talking about the basics. Number one, if you're angry, 
If you're provoked, get your body involved, get your heart racing, take a walk, do some yoga, do something to calm yourself back down. The second bullet point here is a little bit hard for me. I was a debate coach for a lot of years, and it's been kind of ingrained with me. You find arguments that help you win. His point is value learning above debate. Value learning, and I think it might be better phrased, value learning over winning a debate. Number three, and I think this one's been important for me, avoid people who fan the flames. If people are around you who just want to get everybody riled up all the time, avoid those people. The fourth one, sometimes it's okay to just not respond. You don't have to agree with all of the quote unquote right minded people. In fact, if they demand your agreement, it's probably a group you should get out of. Look for the people who A, want a community, and B, and I think this is much more important, can disagree with equanimity. In other words, they can disagree and still go have a cup of coffee after they disagree. They can disagree today, agree tomorrow, agree the next day, disagree the next day. They know how to disagree with each other because knowing how to disagree, even though it's not part of Jacob's definition, I think is a key element of learning how to think. Listen without responding to fair-minded people and then think about what they are saying. I realize we're using think here in two definitions. Jacob's big, long operational definition. Here, I think it's just the element of consider what they are saying. First, listen. Listening is difficult. Everybody wants to respond. Everybody wants to write down all the notes. Everybody wants to, but, 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 but. Think about what they are saying. Consider what they are saying. The next one, ex, ex, assess your repugnances. If you look down at the bullet point right underneath that, it says, realize what the ick factor may be a distraction. In other words, if this is a thing that makes you go ick, if this is a thing that produces this strong emotional response, is it the strong emotional response? Is it the ick factor that matters? Or is it something else deep down? And so the old cliche used to be, you know, be strong in matters of morality, be open-minded in matters of taste. Is this a repugnance of just a matter of taste? Don't let the metaphors, don't let the myths, don't let the things that you've always believed do too much heavy lifting. Finally, try to use the language that other people use. Try to understand their position in their language try to say it back to them try to understand their argumentative language their argumentative terms and then it takes a lot of guts to think it takes a lot of guts to disagree with your social group it takes a lot of guts to sometimes admit that you're wrong his last thing there is be brave i think this is going to wrap it up I hope that some of this ties together for the operational definition, for the idea that the purpose of an English department is to teach people to think creatively and logically. And I hope everyone has a good day. Hope to see you in the next class period.